Well, I'd like to welcome everybody. Um, I'm David Pumphrey. I'm with the Energy and National Security Program here at CSIS, and it's, it's my honor to uh, do the introductions for our three speakers here today. Uh, the IEA has uh, become the respected place for looking at what's going on in the energy world, both in the short term and the long term. And the introduction a few years ago of these medium-term uh, reports has been a real addition to the insights we can gain about the trends that are going on in um, energy markets. And I think to have them presented to together, uh, both the gas and the oil, is really a very important step forward. So it is really a great pleasure to, to welcome uh, Executive Director Tanaka, Ian Cronshaw, and David Fife here to um, do the presentation. They just released this yesterday in Paris and hopped on a plane and flew over here. So I think we're the first or the second audience outside of uh, uh, Paris that has the opportunity to um, hear the uh, presentations. Uh, we've passed out some biographical information, so I won't uh, spend a lot of time on that. And we'll start with uh, Mr. Tanaka, who will open it. And then after their presentations, there will be a little time for uh, Q's and A's. So Mr. Tanaka, please. Thank you, David, for uh, providing us an opportunity. And uh, good, mo uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am still in a jet lag. Uh, I really thank CSIS to provide us uh, the opportunity to present our two many very important document, the Midtime Oil Market Report and Natural Gas Market Review. These are the two uh, documents which uh, we, uh, we annually uh, publicize, but it's getting more and more important because the issue which we are now concerned with is this uncertainty. So we are living in uncertain times. So how can we get our future more clearer? I hope these two documents will contribute to the better understanding of the market. We think that financial landscape has changed dramatically over the past 12 months. And the global financial and economic crisis has had a hugely significant impact on the oil and gas sector as well. For oil, the price is, is uh, around half the levels <coughs> seen in July last year. We noticed that it went up to 147 US dollars per barrel. But they have began to strengthen again recently, partly due to a perception that economic recovery may be just around the corner. In the natural gas sector, we have moved from a tight supply and demand balance with extremely high gas prices to the one that is easing with plummeting prices. The gas prices are now less than a third of their peaks of mid-2008 and seem slower to respond to signs of recovery. Recent years have seen big increases in the gas supply, notably from North American unconventional gas or gas shales, from LNG globally, and from new IEA suppliers such as Norway and Australia. The question remains in the medium term as to where the next big tranche of supply can be expected to be sourced. And both the oil and the gas markets, like all others, face enormous uncertainty with respect to the timing, pace, and extent of economic rebound. Whether we end up facing a supply crunch again by mid-decade, or with a more comfortable buffer of supply flexibility depends largely on the pace of economic recovery and the government action on energy efficiency. This second part is a very important message in this oil market report. We must be careful a return to razor thin spare capacity in the case of crude oil and resultant price volatility is in the interests of neither producers nor our consumers. For both oil and gas, the importance of continued long-term supply investment through the down cycle is clear. But the future is also partly in our hands. The governments can influence the path 
that oil and gas markets take. For both on oil and gas, a level of investment playing fields would help ensure the development of sufficient supplies when demand growth recovers. For gas, critical improvements need to be made in developing cross-border interconnections and promoting more efficient market operations, especially in Europe. But consumer governments also have a key role to play in the future of the oil and gas sectors by ensuring fuel diversity and promoting energy efficiency. Given the current market and the sectoral focus of future demand growth, now is a golden opportunity for consumer governments to introduce long-term energy efficiency measures for transport. Higher efficiency in transport can help to promote sustainable growth and at the same time enhance our energy security and helps mitigate climate change. Um, this administration's move to improve U.S. fuel economy to 35.5 MPG by 2016, which is equivalent to the 6.6 .6 liter per 100 kilometers and represents a 30% reduction in the fuel use compared to the new U.S. light duty vehicles in 2005. The IA commends the U.S. for this initiative. And a permanent structural change in demand patterns may already be underway. With General Motors, with General Motors and Chrysler filing for Chapter 11 here in the United States, plus sharp de reduction in the OECD steel making, for example, it is a fair question. Not only road transport, but also airline and power sector demand appears to be seeing a reduction in the intensity of oil use. The gas remains an important bridging fuel to allow to a low carbon future, especially in the power sector. But IEA countries need to invest in a diverse range of power supply options, including renewable, and nuclear and coal with improved environmental performance like CCS. It is essential that we place a low carbon future and energy security at the forefront of attempts to kickstart economic recovery. As well as we all know too well, energy demand will expand significantly again to fuel renewed global economic growth particularly in non-OECD countries. This is uh, already altering the focus of IA analysis, particularly as regards energy security. And energy security now encompasses gas security as well as oil. Indeed, the IA remains concerned about the prospects for uninterrupted gas supplies to European and global markets from Russia via Ukraine. With respect to climate change, we are currently on a track for a rise in a temperature of 6 degrees centigrade by the end of the century, an unsustainable path. It, in the short term, slower economic growth will curb emission, but potentially weaker fossil fuel prices and financing difficulties are curbing investment in clean energy technologies, which may in turn prolong our reliance on fossil fuel. Then in the mid and longer term, the crisis may lead to higher emissions. We must not let the current financial crisis overshadow these longer term challenges. But oil and gas will remain central to our energy needs for decades to come. Both fabrications, this mid-term oil market report as well as gas market review that we are launching here today shed light on where we are likely to be in five to ten years time based on existing investment plans and policies. As such, we hope that they assist planners, policy makers and the industry in better appreciating the context of the challenges we face for the future. And thank you very much, and I will let 
our best and brightest to explain about uh, their individual report. The first, David Fife, and then Jan Kronsha. familiar. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd just like to repeat uh, Mr. Tanaka's uh, big thank you to CSIS for allowing us to launch our two publications here uh, in the U.S. today. Uh, I think I've been allocated 20 minutes to try and summarize our view of the oil market over the next uh, five years, which is a bit of a big task. So what you're going to get is very much a, a condensed version of what's in the report. We'll welcome your questions today, but we'll also welcome any questions on the substance or the methodology or the approach over the next days and weeks after people have a chance to, to read through the report. Uh, so we, we, we look forward to people's f uh, feedback and very much welcome it. Um, before going into some of the detail, I think it's probably worth uh, just summarizing some of the key issues that we think the report raises uh, for, for, for the oil market. Uh, as Mr. Tanaka said, the, the, key, the key issue we face is what sort of economic path are we on for the next five years? Is it a reversion to business as usual, or are we going to see a more subdued growth trend, economically speaking, over the next five years? That's clearly going to be critical. Uh, and that has caused us this year, uh, exceptionally for the midterm market report, to generate a couple of scenarios. Arguably, we could have generated four or five scenarios for oil demand in particular going forward. Um, the pace of the demand rebound amid structural change. Uh, the question about have we seen demand destruction or just demand suppression in the light of economic collapse and last year's much, much higher prices. I think that's a, still a very live issue. We, we make some points about that, and we, we sort of veer perhaps a little bit more towards the demand destruction argument in our report, but I don't think anyone can be certain about that until we pull out of the, the economic recession that we're, we're currently suffering from. Um, the impact of economic uncertainty and price volatility on investment, upstream and downstream, is going to be critical. Again, it's something that it's going to take time for us to, to, to realize. Spending levels upstream are likely to be off around 20 percent this year. Uh, how long are those sort of split spending curves going to be in place? Um, we think basically that oil supply growth over the next five years is going to be even slower than it has been in the past five years, which is saying quite a lot, I think, because uh, the period, certainly this decade, has been one in which it's become more and more difficult to expand the supply base uh, in a timely fashion. We think uh, conventional crude oil supplies uh, are likely to look very, very sluggish in growth terms over the next five years, uh, but we do think there are offsets from things like biofuels, natural gas liquids, and non-conventional oil, even in this time horizon on the basis of, uh, of investments that are already being made. We highlight yet again the, 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 the almost perennial issue of refining boom and bust, the downstream sector of the industry, which uh, tends to face even more volatility than the upstream in terms of profitability. Uh, and we see potentially a reversion to rather depressed uh, returns in refining uh, becoming reinstated uh, over the next three to four years. Um, and I suppose it all comes down to at the end. The thing we try and get to at the end of our report is are we in for another supply crunch type situation with capacity growth struggling to keep up with demand growth or are we going to see something which looks a bit easier, uh, a little bit more flexibility in the supply system? We use OPEC spare capacity as the sort of benchmark of how much uh, flexibility there, there is within the system. And depending on the scenario you're looking at, you get very, very different answers, not surprisingly. Um, you can get to an easier uh, supply-demand balance uh, depending on the economic growth scenario you take, but also it can be influenced by the choices of governments and consumers. 
in terms of the, uh, the, the, the choices they make in terms of, of, of purchases, in terms of policies, even over this sort of five-year time horizon. And we end up, I suppose, raising a number of questions about the role for government in this very uncertain economic and energy market. Uh, we need to see investment stimulated somehow. We'd like to see people investing through the down cycle, uh, if at all possible. Um, and we also want to see more energy efficiency. And I think uh, over here in the U.S., that, that's becoming more and more of an issue, clearly. Um, we want to see more market transparency. Uh, we want to see more information about the physical side of the market to allow us, allow us to make judgments about where we may be headed in the years to come. But we also need more transparency on the financial flows into the oil market. The futures market and the physical market go hand in hand nowadays in terms of, 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 of driving prices. Uh, and we need more visibility on what the main actors are doing on both sides of the market to allow us to see what's driving prices and to allow us to make better judgments about where we may, may be headed in the years to come. If we start looking at the demand side of the equation, I mean, the, 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 the revisions that ourselves and other analysts have had to make to our demand estimates, uh, even in the last year, has been very, very dramatic indeed. Um, we started out with a 2009 oil demand forecast a year ago of nearly 88 million barrels per day, and we're now down below 84 million barrels per day. So we've lost 4 million barrels per day of demand, not surprisingly, in the sort of uh, fairly calamitous economic situation that the world has had to confront uh, over the past 12 months or so. Oil demand is falling not only in the OECD, but also in the non-OECD as well. Um, and the bottom line is the short and medium term outlook is hugely uncertain. Now we paint a picture for demand in this outlook with two scenarios. One is a higher GDP uh, assumption and that basically has trend GDP growth going back to between 4 and 5 percent per annum over the, the medium uh, and longer term. Uh, we factor in a price assumption, and everyone gets very excited about the IEA coming out with forecasts of prices. This isn't a price forecast. This was the futures curve uh, back in end April, early May, which was showing about $70 a barrel uh, nominal, $60 per barrel real, going through to 2014. That's the peg on which we're hanging our demand forecast and to a certain extent our supply forecast. Uh, it's not a forecast of prices, it's, a, it's an assumption. So that's what underpins our sort of higher view of the world or our more optimistic view of the world, if you like. But buried in there as well is also a view that uh, the efficiency of oil use is going to continue uh, improving. Oil intensity is going to continue declining uh, and potentially at a, a slightly accelerated rate compared to what we've seen uh, over the past decade. We've got global oil intensity uh, declining by about 2.5% per year compared to about 2%, which is what we've seen over the past decade. Now, we've seen already gains in efficiency use in road and air transport. We're seeing structural change uh, in the power sector as progressively oil is replaced by gas. And we think basically that's going to continue. It's not a very uh, radical view. Uh, remember, this forecast is based on the policies that are in place or likely to be initiated over the next three, four, five years. Um, so it's really a look at the world as it is today uh, and the investment cycle and the policy cycle as it is today. Uh, of course, that efficiency picture could be uh, improved even further with technological breakthroughs or new policy developments. But of course that is more likely to occur in the period after 2015 uh, rather than in the immediate five-year period. There is of course a time lag uh, in these things happening. Okay, I'm skipping slides rather quickly here. A very trigger sensitive uh, uh, computer this. But, uh, Bottom line is, where do we see all the growth in demand coming from in this, in this higher GDP case? It's coming from the non-OECD. There's no surprise there, really. Those are the countries with the, the expectation of stronger GDP growth, higher income elasticity, uh, and if you like, a degree of stickiness in administered prices. The bottom line is, 
that consumers in the developing countries were not paying 100 or 150 dollars per barrel for their oil. They were paying markedly less than that because of price subsidies and administered price regimes. Now, we don't think those are going to be dismantled overnight. We think they're being phased down, if you like. Uh, China is making moves in that regard. India is making moves in that regard. And other countries in the ASEAN and elsewhere are doing so as well. But it's going to take time for those subsidies to be removed. And therefore, there's a degree of resilience uh, in the non-OECD markets, which quite frankly isn't there in the OECD. And we've basically got demand in the OECD stagnating at approximately current levels uh, under the influence of interfuel substitution uh, and, and efficiency improvements. And the non-OECD basically takes on the baton of having uh, accounting for more than 50% of global demand uh, by around 2014. Asia Pacific, Middle East, Latin America is where we think the demand growth is going to come from. Um, again, I'm skipping forward rather too quickly here. Uh, the, the, uh, that slide is telling you that basically most of the growth in oil demand is going to come from transportation fuels and to a lesser extent petrochemicals. Transport fuels are going to generate about 80% of expected demand growth going forward. Um, it's worth pointing out, however, that this relatively optimistic view of the world nonetheless has demand in 2013, which is about 3.5 million barrels per day lower than our forecast even at December last year. So we're, we're in a world that is looking at fundamentally weaker levels of absolute demand, even under this fairly resilient rebound in the economy uh, going forward. But what if that's all hopelessly over-optimistic? What if we're on a track both of slower and lower economic recovery? Uh, we've generated a scenario uh, just r largely for illustration, but the point here is uh, this is sort of trend GDP growth closer to 3% rather than 5% over the outlook period. Um, the bottom line is this gives you a demand number in 2014 that is 4 million barrels per day less than the, the higher GDP scenario. Now, you know, in a, in a 95 million barrel or a 90 million barrel per day world, to the layman, that may not seem like a very big difference, but 4 million barrels makes all the difference in the world to the sort of market uh, profile that we expect uh, for the next five years or so. Not surprisingly, everyone's been focusing on the demand side of the equation as economic uh, performance has been contracting worldwide. But there's a lot going on on the supply side as well. Uh, spending is being curbed. I said earlier on that it's been very difficult to grow the supply side of the equation over the past decade or so, uh, even through the up cycle with prices rising uh, for a whole host of reasons difficulty in accessing reserves, geopolitical issues, industry cycle related issues, bottlenecks in terms of uh, raw materials and labor and so on. Uh, some of those cyclical difficulties are easing, but we nonetheless see it remaining very, very difficult for the industry to expand the supply base over the next five years. A lot of these above ground impediments to supply growth remain in force and they're going to remain with us for the next five years, the next 10 years going forward. We don't think it's a question at the IEA. We don't think it's a question of a lack of resources in terms of physical oil availability. Uh, we think there's plenty of oil out there. It's a question of what level of prices do you need to bring that oil to the market? Uh, a lot of people out there are saying, well, what is the ideal price? What is the price we require uh, to generate new oil supplies to meet demand growth when economic recovery returns? Uh, we actually just think it's a little bit uh, idealistic to believe you can nail an individual price uh, and say that's the level we somehow need to work towards or manage artificially or otherwise in the market as being the ideal price because it's a moving target. We've got structural uh, pressures which are raising the cost of generating new oil supplies, but we've got cyclical pressures which are pushing down the cost of generating new supplies. And the oil sands project that uh, maybe late 2007, early 2008 was going to cost us 
80, 90, 100 dollars per barrel to bring to market possibly now can be brought to market for 60 dollars or 70 dollars. And maybe at the end of 2009 it will cost 50 dollars because of a, cycl a cyclical de decline in inflation pressures. So it's a moving target. I don't think there's any doubt we're moving towards structurally more expensive oil over time. That's very clear because of opportunity constraints. But I think trying to narrow in on $80 per barrel, let's say, as the ideal price uh, is perhaps misguided. Having said that, we are taking a pretty conservative view on non-OPEC supplies going forward. We now see contraction in non-OPEC supply over the next five years of about half a million barrels per day. And that compares with growth from our forecast last year of about one and a half million barrels per day. Um, there's a huge amount of new capacity that is basically being postponed and deferred or even cancelled uh, because of de declining prices, weak demand, and lower spending. Uh, a study that the IA undertook uh, for the G8 in the spring uh, showed about two million barrels per day of projects which were originally due to come on stream in 2009, 10, 11, and which are now slipping beyond that time horizon. They'll probably come back into the mix uh, later on, but it's just going to take longer to bring that capacity on stream. We think conventional crude supplies are likely to carry on declining, but we think there are offsets from non-conventional supplies and gas liquids. Very quickly, sources of supply growth, such as they are over this five-year period, there's no real surprises there. The Canadian oil sands, the active projects that we see on, uh, coming online there, global biofuels. There is growth in crude oil supply coming out of Brazil, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Caspian. Uh, but the North Sea and Mexico and other mature areas are facing a uh, fairly relentless decline going forward. Uh, the big change, I think, in our forecast over the past couple of years has been the changing profile for the former Soviet Union and Russia in particular, which we're now a lot more conservative about prospects for Russia going forward because of a decline rate at mature fields, because of budgetary constraints, debt issues, and so on. Uh, and we basically have a flat FSU profile for the next five years. That's not to say we don't see more growth later on when Kashagan and other headline projects come on stream, but certainly we seem to be in a hiatus for growth from the FSU over this five-year period, which is a huge change for non-OPEC. The FSU was the driver of non-OPEC supply growth over the first half of the decade. Uh, it looks like we're in a bit of a hiatus there going forward. We ran a quick sensitivity to go with our low GDP case um, on the supply side to say, okay, what if com companies don't just curb spending in 2009, but also do so in 2010 and 2011? What potential impact could that have on prompt supply today, on mature oil fields today? And we came up with a number of around about half a million barrels per day downside sensitivity, which on the supply side, could accompany the lower GDP and, by inference, lower price case uh, that we're postulating uh, as our, our, our alternative scenario looking forward over the next uh, five years. But I think there's very little consensus uh, on exactly the impact of lower spending uh, and what it will have on prompt supply as opposed to future projects. I think that's open to a lot of debate. When we look at OPEC, and I could speak about OPEC capacity developments for a lot longer than the minute or two that I've, I've got uh, today, but suffice to say here we've curbed our estimates quite sharply too. We've got a bulge of new OPEC capacity, particularly from Saudi Arabia that is being brought on stream at the moment. Uh, but after 2010, we see a pretty sluggish uh, rate of capacity expansion from OPEC as well. There's a bit coming online from uh, Angola, there's some uh, new capacity from the UAE and elsewhere, but it's pretty small potatoes, really. Uh, and we think on a, in overall terms over the five-year period, it's about 1.7 million barrels of net growth, which is pretty low compared with recent historical levels. And it's to do with project delays, again, that is the primary issue. Uh, reviewed investment plans, renegotiation of contracts to capture uh, lower costs, uh, reduced cash flow, and the perennial problems of resource nationalism and geopolitical turmoil in places like Iraq 
uh, and Nigeria. We can talk about those perhaps in the Q&A. But in contrast um, to the crude oil side of things, we actually see uh, OPEC gas liquids growing quite sharply over the next five years, perhaps by around 2.5 million barrels per day. Uh, you have this interesting situation of OPEC gas liquids potentially competing in the market with OPEC crude. Uh, I know they don't probably see it that way, but it, effectively OPEC gas liquids are, are shutting out OPEC crude from the market to some extent over the next three, four, five years. And Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and to an extent Iran are developing resources as much as anything for internal, internal use rather than export use. So a lot of these projects will be insulated from the economic downturn to a certain extent. And that has huge implications for the refinery feedstock slate going forward. Everyone talks about heavier, sourer barrels being available over the future. Well, I think over the longer term, that's most likely to be the case. But we're again in a hiatus, I think, over the next five years where lighter, sweeter supplies of crude and condensate in particular from the FSU and Africa and the Middle East are likely to ensure a lighter, sweeter barrel that is available for refiners going forward, which is bad news if you're invest, investing in cokers and cracking capacity, as many people are uh, uh, over the next three to five years. Basically, very slow capacity growth after 2010, I think, is the message. Biofuels, we see growth in biofuels, albeit there are big problems for the biofuel side of the equation in supply terms. Oil prices have fallen more sharply and further than agricultural feedstocks, and that's undermined margins. Uh, plant utilization has fallen. Access to credit for smaller operators has dried up, and therefore capacity growth in biofuels this year and next year looks a bit suppressed, uh, even in places like Brazil. Having said that, we still think we could see about 50% supply growth from biofuels over the next five years rising from about 1.5 million barrels per day to over 2 million barrels per day by 2014. And that meets about 15% of expected transportation fuel demand growth uh, over this period. No surprise, Brazil uh, and the U.S. are the main sources of growth going forward because of uh, renewable, renewable fuel mandates and basic uh, uh, geographical and locational benefits that Brazil uh, enjoys. We think Biofuels can rebound because they have relatively short lead times, most of these projects, and therefore when economic recovery kicks in, uh, we think uh, capacity can be expanded relatively quickly. And there's a degree of consolidation in the biofuels industry that is taking place, which means uh, larger, uh, more robust, financial, financially speaking, operators are going to be in place for when the rebound occurs. If we look at the downstream, Huge levels of cancellations and delays to projects are occurring in the downstream too, but surprisingly enough, there's around 7.5 million barrels per day of new active capacity that we think will come on stream over the next five years. Most of that's in Asia, uh, China and India in particular. A lot of it is actually in North America. Um, the Middle East is actually now seeing, we think, rather slower refining capacity growth because of a number of projects have been deferred, either again to capture cost reductions, uh, the negotiating contract, renegotiating contracts to capture cost reductions. Um, but nonetheless, the significant growth in refining capacity over the next five years and significant growth in upgrading capacity, which ties in very poorly with the sort of crude feedstocks crude feedstock slate that I was uh, painting, the picture I was painting for you a minute ago. This is a very static look at where we think the global products markets were he will head, and it's much more a view of pressures that will emerge in the market rather than a forecast of surpluses or deficits, because by definition you can't have global surpluses or deficits of product. But we see the tightness emerging in middle distillates yet again, and remember in 2007 and 2008, it was tightness in the Middle Distillate markets as much as anything else, which was helping propel crude pipe prices higher. But we also see an unsustainable tightening in the bottom end of the barrel in residual fuel oil. With all that cracking capacity being added and all that light feedstock availability, something's got to give. Either people are going to have to run 
uh, a lot more crude through simple refining capacity, or they're going to have to defer some of that upgrading investment, or there are going to have to be such wide, light, heavy, sweet, sour spreads uh, that the system gradually adjusts to ensure that this picture doesn't actually emerge. We think there is real pressure for rationalization in the OECD refining sector, particularly in Europe uh, uh, and the Asia Pacific. And we really think closures or deactivation of capacity are, are very likely um, over the next five years. Uh, it may be deactivation because actually closing a refinery in the OECD is well nigh impossible because of site remediation costs and so on. But uh, rationalization is definitely uh, on the agenda. We did a whole section on price formation, which I can't do justice to now because I'm rapidly running out of time. The debate continues about fundamentals versus speculative factors in the market. And as really we said a year ago, we think both are playing a role. And in the short term, uh, financial flows and speculative players are playing a role in driving prices, but within the context of fundamentals, both today's fundamentals, but people's expectations of fundamentals two, three, four, five years hence. Uh, and these factors are intertwining to drive prices. And I think a polarized view of fundamentals versus speculation is, is misguided in that sense. Price drivers are manifold, uh, and they interact in a different way at different times to drive prices going forward. Uh, and I think anyone looking at the run-up in prices since March would have to say that speculative and financial flows have played a role in that. Uh, the weakness in the dollar has played a role in that. Uh, but over the longer term, s fundamentals of supply and demand and expectations for those for the future are going to set the parameters for prices uh, going forward. But again, we need much more visibility on what is happening in terms of futures trade, in terms of uh, the o OTC derivatives market, and so on. And I think we're going to see that clearly with some of the proposals that are uh, before governments as we speak. But I think the danger is that regulators and legislators throw the baby out with the bathwater, if you'll pardon the expression. Because what we don't want to do is just completely shut off uh, liquidity in the markets altogether. And I think that's a real danger because that could create more volatility than it solves uh, in terms of pricing. Summing it all up, we've got very different views of GDP going forward. We've got a view that efficiency is going to uh, improve going forward. There's a huge difference in our, our two cases in terms of underlying demand of about 4 million barrels per day. We think supply growth is going to be very slow going forward. Uh, what does it mean for spare capacity going forward? Well, in the higher GDP case, you get a traditional market tightening towards the end of this five-year period, a traditional sort of supply crunch picture, which may well occur. And that has obvious implications for prices and volatility if there's a very thin margin of spare capacity. If we're in a lower demand trend, we could be headed towards something that looks a bit more like that in terms of six to seven million barrels per day of spare capacity going forward. Now, some would say that's a very sloppy market. Uh, I think we might argue that that sort of level of spare capacity is probably necessary, given all the geopolitical risks that a number of uh, key producers face when you think of Iran and Iraq and Nigeria and others, and capacity there that is, is frankly at risk on, a, on an almost perennial basis. So we can get there to that more comfortable view of, of spare capacity, either through a lower economic growth trend, but we could also get there with accelerated programs of energy efficiency uh, and consumer and government choices over the next 12 to 18 months. So really, it's something that's going to be generated by the path of the global economic recovery, but we can also play a hand as consumers and governments uh, in the sort of picture we have going forward. Thank you very much. I don't know if we... Okay, the bad news is after 
David's dulcet tones you have an Australian following him up with uh, all the uh, vicissitudes of an accent will follow. If you don't understand a few of the things they say, you're in good company. Almost all of my work colleagues have spent the last four years trying to figure out what exactly I've been saying. I think the theme of the day is definitely uncertainty and, and certainly um, when, you, uh, when you talk about gas, absolutely correct. Uh, gas demand weakening everywhere, um, certainly in the United States and in Europe. Um, a very similar picture across all OECD economies. Uh, industrial demand in particular down heavily of the order of 14, 15 per cent, um, worse in Russia and Ukraine. Um, even fairly bad in Japan and Germany, not quite so bad in the US, but still still down a lot. The surprising thing about, about the development has been that the power sector has managed to hold up its market share in a number of areas, and I'll come back to that in a minute, because the power sector, of course, is something like a third of demand. Uh, industrial is about a third, um, residential, commercial about a third as well. Ten that sector tends to be relatively inelastic. So overall, uh, gas demand has actually held up in some ways surprisingly well. The second feature we talk about in the review is the supply side, in particular liquefaction capacity, LNG. Um, last year in the US we saw a big fall in LNG imports. Uh, 2007 had been a, a good year, 23 BCM thereabouts, um, 2.3 BCF per day. Uh, last year under 10, a big fall. And the reason, uh, the reason for that I'll come to in a moment. Spot prices, um, no, no OPEC uh, in the gas market, and spot prices last year peaked a little bit earlier. Uh, about the last week of June, in fact, Henry Hub peaked about 13.70 and has really struggled to get above $4. Even we had got a nice heat wave in Houston, normally that's the sign for the gas market to firm up a bit. 102 yesterday in Houston. I'm, Washington's warm, but Houston's warmer. Um, but hasn't put much starch into gas markets at all. Uh, on the contrary, however, in, uh, in oil and gas, oil and gas markets, we've seen prices hover at around $8. Um, they'll come down tomorrow. That's the beauty about these oil link markets, they're nice and predictable in prices, um, come down to about 6 or $7. But of course, anywhere where there's competition between spot gas and um, oil link gas, we've seen spot gas win market share. And that's particularly important if you're Gazprom, who are the world's biggest gas exporter, they've lost market share and they've lost it a lot. Unconventional gas has definitely changed the scene in North America, there's no doubt about that. But that has global implications as well, both from its impact on LNG markets, which are linking, definitely linking Europe and America, that's clear, but also even the Pacific markets. Um, the question is, of course, at $4, how long can this boom continue? Um, back about a year ago, everyone, everyone was sitting around Madrid, this time last year, almost to the day, saying if prices go below 10, unconventional gas will collapse, and then it became 7, and then it became 6. Um, so I'll be interested in your views on that. Final point, of course, gas markets are becoming more interdependent. Regional issues remain, but this interdependence is a very important part of what's changed in the gas market. So, um, looking, at, looking at this, this is, um, unfortunately I'm talking BCM here um, for a European audience. Um, I, can, I can translate that into, well, translate it into BCF per day if you like. It's one of the problems when you come over here, you step on the scales and suddenly you go from being a 72 kilo person to a 161 pound person. It's a bit, bit, bit scary actually. So I worked that one out this morning. Um, but I think the direction of these, these numbers is pretty clear. We had an absolute boom in the first half of last year. People have forgotten a bit, of, bit about that. I mean, 50, this is OECD across the board, but if I did this graph for the United States, it looked very similar. Japan, very similar. Um, even, even in countries like Europe, very mature markets, Germany, um, grew by 8% in those early months of the year. And then obviously things started to slow down and then in the second, late in the second half of the, the year, weakening in demand. Overall, for most markets, um, we still saw positive growth, albeit small. Um, the US was up about 1% for the year as a whole. Pretty typical. Um, Japan was a bit more than that for various reasons. Um, of course, the, the last quarter, um, first quarter of this year, we've seen um, that last that bar in March is about equivalent of minus 7%. Uh, for the US, it was minus 8 And it's all on the back of industrial demand. Power sector demand held up quite well. I just I downloaded the April numbers last night and they actually still show much the same. It was down about minus five for the year, uh, for, for April, uh, year on year, and all of that was in industrial, which is down minus 13. So when you look at that data, um, I don't see any green shoots in that data. Having said that, of course, in the last couple of months, we are seeing some encouraging signs, things like Chinese power demand starting to grow again. Uh, even in the US, we've seen vehicle sales rise from admittedly abysmal levels. 
and, and some slowdown in unemployment levels. What of course that graph means is if you say to me what's 09 going to look like as the year goes on, um, well that, that makes, if you take that as a straight line and there's some, I've got some colleagues in Russia who are taking that as a straight line, you come up with minus 10. I don't think it will be minus 10 but certainly this year anywhere between minus 3 and minus 5 in most OECD countries. Power sector is worth talking about a fair bit here because uh, it's been an interesting part of the sector and, and a surprisingly strong performer. 2008, we actually saw a small decline in OECD power demand, obviously, again, reflecting the pattern we saw in the first graph, um, which, is, which is interesting in itself. Um, what did happen overall, though, was that gas maintained its market share. When you look at the 2008 figures, gas maintained this pattern that you see here. And again, almost any IEA country you look at, growth over there, 1,000 terawatt hours, just to put that in perspective, is about total Japanese power demand, so that's growth um, in the OECD. 80% of it came from gas. Um, wind and other renewables, about 20%, and coal and oil basically offsetting each other. Um, new, new, I mean, you can pretty much predict this pattern for the next five, even as much as eight years in the future, this will remain in OECD countries for the simple reason what's being built at the moment, nuclear, pretty much nothing to a close first approximation, coal, only in a handful of countries, including the United States, because a lot of old plant will be phased out in the next five years. Um, Given the investment problems we have, of course, investing in a nice new nuclear or coal plant is probably not high on the list of investment priorities. But, but gas has a lot of attractions. So um, the nice thing about the US is uh, when we started to see the slowdown in demand, I, I was sort of rash enough to say, well, gas is the most expensive source, so it'll probably get backed out first. Um, that has not occurred. In fact, quite, quite the contrary. Um, we knew it would come out of fossil fuels, but in the case of the United States and in a number of IEA countries, it has been coal that has suffered. United States first four months of this year, power demand is down about 5%. Um, coal, coal demand in the power sector is down 10, um, and that's quite a dramatic change. And in fact, gas has actually increased its market share. Um, nothing a bit of price competition can't do, and certainly we're seeing utilities compete ferociously um, for market share. Gas supply highlights. Well, OECD production actually increased, and obviously North America had a fair bit to do with that, and I'll come back to that. Um, all OECD regions, however, remain at the margin import dependent. North America, only very much at the margin. Europe, uh, OECD Pacific, 100%, and Europe in the middle. And of course, European gas security, I'll come back to the end of the presentation, European gas security, um, got some interesting things to say there. North America, I mean, up until about 2005, 2006, conventional wisdom was North American gas production trending downwards at around about 20 BCM per annum, 2 BCF per day. Um, suddenly since then we've seen this dramatic increase and now we've seen US unconventional gas rise 50 BCM. Now that's you know, a turnaround of about a 70 BCM, that's a million and a half barrels a day of oil. Now if that had happened in the oil industry, that would be headline item in David's review, but because it's in gas no one seems to pay any attention. Um, but believe me, um, people who are shipping LNG are certainly paying attention because they've built LNG terminals in the United States, but their utilisation rate is not high. Um, again, the way LNG is working. So this, this has global implications because it means that LNG that was LNG plant that was designed to supply US markets is looking for homes elsewhere. Uh, Norway, Norway's uh, up to nearly 100 BCM exports, which makes it amongst the world's biggest gas exporters, just quietly getting on with the job. Um, but elsewhere, the United Kingdom in particular, we're seeing production declines and we're seeing rapid production declines. They slowed down a little bit when prices were high last year, but now that prices have dropped, we're seeing the 8, 9, 10 percent decline that we've anticipated. Just a little bit more on the United States, given we are in Washington. Um, one of the first sectors, um, the US gas sector, very sensitive to prices, in particular the rig count, and we've seen these sharp reductions in rig counts, which to all intents and purposes we thought would presage a very quick and clear drop in US gas production unconventional. Um, but like all good recessions, it's been the poor quality plant that's gone out first. Uh, the good quality plant, particular horizontal drilling rigs, so important for an unconventional gas, seem to have stayed in the mix. And producers have been pretty successful at cutting costs or driving costs down. Because as you can see over on, that, on the far chart, um, there's a little black line at the top, which still shows that even at $4 gas, producers are still increasing production. And some of those producers, of course, hedge forward at 8 9 or even $10. Um, so that's well and good. Um, but having said that, I think that's quite a surprising outcome. Um, February there, of course, February this year had an extra day. So in fact, 
fact that those points are pretty much concurrent with the 2008 line, which as you can see is 50 BCM above, above the pre preceding years. Um, the fact that we're still seeing three, and indeed this year, we, this month, April, we're still seeing 3% growth. Um, it will come down at some point, but it has been remarkably resilient in the face of, of those prices. I wanted to talk a little bit about non-OECD countries because half of, half of, OEC, half of um, world global gas demand comes from non-OECD countries. And there's some pretty interesting ones here. I mean, Russia, obviously, number two, um, 440-odd BCM of gas consumed, about two-thirds of, of US consumption. Um, Russia's not going to have a good year this year, probably down minus eight, roughly in line with their economy, possibly even minus 10. Um, Gazprom, in particular, has had a pretty bad first half of this year. Export shipments down by by almost half in volume terms, and obviously their own domestic consumers hit, hit hard as well. Um, Middle East, big growth area. We can certainly continue to look forward to, to growth and gas use of around about 20% between now and 2015. The two interesting markets I want to talk about were both China and India, where we have seen a big turnaround in the last year. Both countries weren't too interested when gas was 10 or $12, but they got lots, lots more interested when gas is 4 and $5. And both countries have been very aggressive, or I should perhaps say assertive, in, in going out and signing up new deals. Um, China, in particular, only started importing LNG in 2006 from Australia. They got, they got a pretty good deal at the time, uh, $3. Um, when gas was 12, it was looking pretty sad, but we've kept doing it at $3. Long story on that one. Um, having said that, they've already signed 24 BCM of uh, import contracts, and they, built, they are building the terminals, and they will import around about 24 BCM, 25 BCM, by 2011, which is roughly the amount of LNG the, the US imported in 2007. Uh, secondly, they are aggressively signing up deals in advance of FID for new LNG projects, um, both in Australia, both Gorgon and, uh, and a coal bed methane project, Gladstone on the East Coast. And they've taken a very aggressive stance in Turkmenistan. They are actually building a pipeline from Turkmenistan way out to the uh, way out on the left-hand edge of that diagram, about another 2,000 kilometres to the east, which will link up with that west-east pipeline. That pipeline was built in three years, I might add. That's about, that's about a 4,000 kilometre pipeline. Built that in three years. They doubled it and plans to triple it and to quadruple it. Um, so certainly domestic uh, gas production is also growing as well. We actually observed in the gas market view we were a bit concerned about upstream investment in Turkmenistan to support that pipeline. And lo and behold, two weeks after we went to the printer, the Chinese came out and announced the $3 billion deal to address upstream gas production issues in Turkmenistan. So they're at it and they're, they're working hard. Um, another, another, post, uh, another deal is a dotted line down in the corner from Myanmar into Yunnan province to Kunming, 12 BCM. They've signed that, signed that in the last few months as well. So all of that means that within, a couple of, within about three or four years, we could easily see China, which as you can see from the top of the slide, actually increased its gas use by 14% last year. Um, easily be 140 or even 150 BCM gas consumer in the medium term by 2015, which would put it number three globally behind US and, and Russia. Now, we've seen China do this with, uh, with oil markets and indeed to some extent even with coal markets. Uh, I have a sneaking feeling they may, they may do it as well with gas. India, pretty similar story, a market that really wasn't interested with gas at 12, but it's getting really interested with gas at four. And of course, this is a market that's very handy to guitar a large LNG supply. So there's a pretty good opportunity. Now, I said 30 BCM by end 2009. I think that's a bit optimistic. But certainly by 2011, we could see 30 BCM of gas going into, into India. Um, and certainly the big new gas discovery, the Krishna Godavari discovery, highlights the fact that if you start to get your domestic price signals right, you will. There's a lot of gas in offshore waters. Um, so there's 30 BCM coming out of Krishna Godavari in the next two or three years as well. Um, so India is going to go from being a 40 BCM country to an 80 or 90 BCM country, which will make it as big as Germany or Italy, say. So suddenly these countries are, are turning over the consumption pattern that we're seeing in OECD. Just to talk a little bit about, about gas prices, as I said, we saw a dramatic fall. Um, no OPEC, no OPEC here, I'm afraid, in gas, or not yet anyway. Um, oil link prices changing much more slowly, um, and we're seeing a lot more gas on gas competition. It's an Ill, Ill wind that blows no good because Europe is finally discovering the joys of gas on gas competition, which the United States has known about for some decades. What we are seeing also is that NBP, the, the, the British hub price and Henry hub gas prices, starting to converge. That's a pretty interesting phenomenon. The, the arbitrage works pretty well across the Atlantic and certainly in the last, uh, the last few months. 
just to graphically show that, I mean, if you're not that familiar, you know, the colours there haven't come out that well, but the bottom line is the Henry Hub, gra Henry Hub line, and as you can see, the US has enjoyed the cheapest gas prices globally for, for some time. Uh, the British market was a bit slower to come down, and indeed in January, you can see it sort of plateaued out there, um, January the British market actually managed to import oil-based prices, owing to the fact that it became actually a large gas exporter, um, something to do with the Russia-Ukraine dispute. I'll come back to that a little later. And we've seen the two, the two of the major oil indices there. Um, the, low, the, the highest one is the Japanese price, but that's got a slower, um, it's got a quicker turnover on the oil price, so it will drop quicker than the German price. And of course, anybody who's selling spot gas into that market is making a killing at the moment uh, into those German markets. We spend a lot of time in the book on LNG markets, and there are several reasons for that. Um, LNG is, is the glue that's linking markets together. Obviously, pipelines stay fixed, but LNG does not, uh, and is moving and has moved a lot. Strong demand growth. Um, this is a, a market that's growing rapidly, but the most interesting aspect about it is what will happen in the, the few years ahead. Uh, let me just quickly run through there. Uncertainty for the second half of the year. Again, that's the key theme of the presentations. There's a lot more gas coming into, into markets. Um, where does it go? How will it be worked out? That's what happened in 2000, and uh, what's shown there at the moment is 2008. And the dramatic difference was this bottom line, the 20 BCM down the bottom that went from Atlantic markets into Pacific. That's the biggest movement of LNG we've seen between basins ever. In the past, LNG has tended to stay where, effectively where it's produced, uh, driven by two things. One, an increase in Asian LNG demand and secondly, the availability of that LNG, which was destined for American markets. As I said, um, the American markets were not as attractive as they might be. And of course, this gas is not, to, not tied down by long-term contracts and does move according to price or demand and price signals. So with a bit of luck, um, what we anticipate happening is that gas, which went happily from the Atlantic into the Pacific Basin, um, that movement will definitely weaken Japanese or Asian demand is much, much weaker and that gas effectively coming from the Middle East will move into Atlantic markets. Most of it, we believe, to Europe, but some will find a home in the United States as the market of last resort. Um, they may not make a lot of money on that, particularly if prices stay at $4. Net back, net back to Qatar at $4, Henry Hub's probably not going to be more than about 250 This is the other supply side of LNG. This was uh, only a couple of years ago. It was a 200 BCM industry globally. Um, by 2013, it'll be a 400 BCM industry, and that's the growth. These plants are being built. They will be built. Um, there may be some slippage in their completion, but by and large, that gas will, will come on. Driven by a couple of things, certainly the fact that people who built it want a bit of cash flow, having committed large licks of money. All of these plants were committed before 2005, I might add, um, but also the gas liquids associated with them a good cash flow as well. Mostly Qatari gas, but a whole range of projects from Australia to Algeria to Angola and Indonesia, Yemen. It's a global industry, uh, and this is, this is a dramatic change in the supply outlook. Um, a lot of this is, does not have long-term contracts associated with it and will move. Turning investment, obviously every, ca every producer's cash flow has struggled in the current environment. Uh, even though costs have fallen, everyone's making cuts, as David said. We produced this document uh, a few months ago for the, for the G8 countries. Surprisingly enough, um, gas, didn't, gas projects didn't feature very prominently in the list, the reason being there weren't many of them in there in the first place. The ones that are committed are going ahead, um, but lots of other ones simply aren't on the, on, the, uh, on the FID list. This was, gas investment was already a problem prior to the crisis. Obviously, this is the, the crisis is only going to make this worse, and in particular in Europe, where we need investments in gas, of course, need to be right through the, the production chain, the supply chain. It's not just a matter of upstream. You've got to build the pipes. You've got to build the interconnectors. You've got to build the terminals. We've built the LNG terminals. We've built LNG plant, but we haven't built enough pipelines, and we certainly haven't built enough interconnectors. Uh, this will be a very, very tough environment to get FID on the big capital-intensive gas projects, particularly LNG projects. We've only averaged one a year for the last four years. We've only seen one in the last two years, and I think it'll be very, very hard to bring a big LNG project to, to FID in the current financial circumstances. I'll, I'll just give you, I mean, we know credit conditions are, are easing, but one of the big LNG producers, that Pluto project I referred to, Woodside Petroleum, had to go to markets in February 
to borrow money. They, they wanted a billion, three, $1.3 billion. They got a billion. They paid 650 basis points over the interbank rate. Now, anyone who's had to borrow money for a large commercial project knows that the 650 probably should have been a company killer. The only reason it wasn't is because, of course, the base rates have been cut so, um, so sharply in, uh, in all major OECD countries. Um, in terms of Russia, world's biggest gas producer, inevitably Gazprom's cash flow. It wasn't that long ago Gazprom was, was rated nearly the biggest company in the world. It was until its stock value lost 80% in four months last year, uh, since made a bit of a recovery. But their cash flow has, has been hammered, as I said, export sales first half. We expect them to pick up in the second half, but the first half has, has, been, uh, has been poor, and gas prices, of course, have fallen as well. So their, their cash flow is probably down by nearly half gross cash flow and investments will have to suffer. Uh, we've already seen investments delayed in Yamal, in, in Bovin and Skoya, and we anticipate more cuts will come um, very shortly. Of course, the, the last point here, echoing Tanaka San's comment, uh, gas demand can and may well rebound relatively quickly, especially in the power sector, obviously assuming the profile of economic growth recovery. If the recovery is slow, then that won't happen. But the supply side is, doesn't have that uncertainty about it. We know what's happening on the supply side, and we know new projects take long, long lead times. Uh, even a project that will be announced tomorrow in the LNG won't contribute to a 2015 um, supply. Just a couple of, a couple of points about um, pipelines here. This is a European pipeline, ScanLED, which is a project up in the, up in the obviously, is the, in the Scandinavian countries, has been cancelled outright. Nord Stream still going ahead. Um, Pipes, in fact, pipes have been acquired and coded and they're sitting up near St. Petersburg. I, I saw them last year, um, but the Swedes still haven't given their approval for that pipeline. So there's a, there's a billion and a half dollars worth of steel sitting up there gathered, getting rusting, rusty up near St. Petersburg. Um, a exa good example of the problems these large-scale pipeline projects face. Nabucco, um, ever since I've been coming to the IEA, I've been going to presentations by the Nabucco Consortium. Their PowerPoint presentations get better and better. They have these nice animations and so on but they still haven't got any steel in the ground. It's not a criticism, it's just a very tough project to get rolling. In comparison, the pipe down in the left in the right-hand corner, Turkmen China pipeline, that's up and running. Uh, the Chinese don't muck around, they, get, they don't talk about it, and they certainly don't do flashy PowerPoints, they just get on and build it, and that pipeline will, will end a service. Um, I could talk a lot about all of these. The black, the black dots, interestingly enough, rec, uh, are LNG terminals. Um, Europe imports about, last year imported about 10% of its gas supply as LNG. You can see all those stars are proposed projects, and some of them are actually real projects, amazingly enough. Um, Europe will certainly have the capacity to import at least double that amount, easily 120 BCM within a few years. Whether they will or not, well, that's another question. A um, little talk about the Ukraine. Um, couldn't let a review of, uh, of the gas year go by without talking about, about this dis about disruption. Just to put it in perspective, it, it was roughly uh, the same size as Hurricane Katrina-related gas disruptions in the United States in terms of market size, um, but of course um, it was a little bit bigger and of course came in the middle of January when demand was much higher and the winter was much cooler. Indeed, Paris was about minus 18, which you know, might not sound that cold to you and certainly doesn't sound very cold to a Russian, but it was cool enough to me, thanks very much. Um, heating demand was up, um, peak demand was up. So. Um, more importantly, and the big difference with Katrina is that the European market, unlike, unlike the American market, the European market does not um, allow gas to move easily from where it's current, where it's meant to go, um, where it's long-term contract. And indeed, these market weaknesses were cruelly exposed, especially in Eastern Europe, where a number of countries suffered. So these are big volumes of lost gas, and, and that's a lot of money for Gazprom, somewhere between one and a half, or about one and a half billion dollars, I guess, which they probably won't get back. In the book, we actually ran through what happened in terms of timelines. Interesting things that happened when the dispute started, or actually started on the 1st of January when Ukrainian gas was cut off, and on the 7th of January, um, transit gas was cut off as well. Two important things happened. The Russians used their other transit routes to increase gas, and I think they deserve a small amount of credit for that. But more interestingly, the United Kingdom, which imports no Russian gas, and therefore the United Kingdom minister, it was very amusing, he went on TV, I can't do his pompous British accent, but he, you, have to get the, you have to get the feeling he sort of said along the lines of, well, Her Majesty's government is, of course, monitoring the situation extremely, extremely closely. But, of course, as Britain imports no Russian gas, we anticipate absolutely no impact on the gas industry in Britain. That was good because what it meant was, of course, the continent was short and the, the pipe that runs between 
Belgium and Britain is reversible, and indeed Britain became a transit country for the, um, for the duration of this dispute, a very big transit country. Just quickly, other movements did happen, but these were much, much smaller and much, much later. This is a market that is, is at their slow and doesn't work. Um, these are very small movements, the gas heading into the sort of southeastern corner, and indeed rather belatedly, the day, uh, the day before the dispute finished, the, the Greeks finally managed to get some gas into Bulgaria. Uh, interestingly enough, that arrow at the bottom, spot LNG, a very important part of supply for both, um, both Greece and Turkey. S Span, uh, Spain, big, Spain's the biggest LNG importer in Europe. Spain had a nice wet year, plenty of hydro, and in fact a nice windy year as well. Actually didn't need its gas. In fact, gas is down about 20% in Spain. Um, they've had this minor thing called a recession as well. Um, that's had a bit of an impact. But certainly there was gas available, and there were Spanish cargoes that went from Egypt direct to Turkey only take about a day or two to get there. Um, if you think, I was going to say, if you think um, unemployment's bad in the US, um, Spanish unemployment's 19% at the moment. Just think about that. Um, this is a summary of, of how this was fixed. Um, there's a couple of interesting messages here. Um, the United Kingdom storage, as you can see down in that bottom right, bottom left corner, um, quite a big contribution and indeed um, that flowed as far as Germany. We actually know that flowed into Germany, which is why the German storage draw wasn't anywhere near as large as it should have been. The Italian storage draw was big. You can see other Russian routes, LNG. Um, this is a market that didn't work, but it, it muddled through. I think that would be the best description. But you need to ask some pretty severe questions here, in particular, if the dispute had lasted another week or two, what would have happened, or if it had happened, say, at the end of March, because this is commercial storage, end of March, when that storage would have been depleted, it would have been a different story. So there's is a good story there. Um, final slide, just to conclude our deliberations about the importance of economic growth in terms of our estimates for demand. We've postulated sort of three paths here. Firstly, a slow economic recovery, but also one where most users begin to concentrate on energy efficiency and non-CO2 emitting technologies, especially renewables, which limits gas growth in the power sector. And as you can see, that, that bottom curve effectively by about 2015 just gets you back to 2007 8 demand. In the US, that's about 650 BCM, 65 BCF a day. So that's, that's a slow growth scenario. If you're an investor, that's a fair risk to take. You're going to have to wait six or seven years to put new supply. Okay, it's a, it's a bit more dynamic than that. Even in even this business as usual, our, our second scenario. In the case of the, of the US, that would only get gas demand up, back up to about 680 BCM compared to 657 last year um, by 2015, and that is a very slow growth path. And we have a, a, a final, well, I say, I say the never-never scenario. It's a bit unfortunate given Michael Jackson died last week, sorry. Um, but uh, no investment in power generation, economic recovery is rapid, and gas comes back into the power mix. That's the, probably the scenario that we postulated last year in, in the World Energy Outlook, um, but believe me, this year's scenario in the World Energy Outlook will be quite different. So with those um, hopefully optimistic words, um, I'd just like to thank our friends here at CSIS and a lot of old friends here in the audience, and uh, we welcome comments, questions, feedback on everything we've said. Thank you. So. We have about 20 or 20 some minutes. Uh, any questions? Please go ahead. Good morning. Good afternoon. My name is Julia. I'm with Slotkin. Just seeing a slump from the, uh, the uh, Obama administration in, uh, in the uh, uh, energy efficiency standards and push and the fuel efficiency uh, vehicles. I would just like to know uh, if you think there's going to be any uh, immediate impact on oil and gas uh, demand. Immediate, uh, I would say, uh, impact is uh, difficult to guess, but suddenly when this uh, fuel standard is really working and uh, U.S. gasoline demand is about 9 million barrels, 9 million barrels per day. And uh, if efficiency works, and 30 percent efficiency means 3 million barrels per day. It's a huge impact will come. Of course, this, uh, let's say, as a whole fleet, 
this efficiency gain uh, may take time, but uh, this direction is uh, definitely uh, which we want to see happen. IEA is promoting the so-called 50 by 50 initiative. Is 50 percent uh, fuel uh, efficiency increase by 2050 for the all car fleet? And uh, in fact, uh, this new administration's uh, decision is just in line with this kind of direction, and uh, we are really applauding for uh, for this. In fact, in our uh, oil market report, uh, we have prepared two scenarios, higher economic growth scenario and lower economic growth scenario. And uh, as uh, David say, there are four million barrels per day difference in terms of the spare capacity towards 2014. There is three, the third scenario is hidden in between. And if that is what uh, we call the, the government action on efficiency as well as structural change, I mean uh, uh, demand destruction may happen by the change of uh, uh, consumer behavior. And it's already clear that uh, GM or Chrysler collapse is a clear evidence of the structural changes happening already here. And if this happens, certainly we may see the higher economic growth with lower oil demand. And certainly this has an impact in, in the market toward 2014. Any other question? Just to follow up on the question about the impact on the power sector and gas, gas use in particular, I mean, obviously we, we welcome improvements in energy efficiency and, and a move to renewable technologies. Uh, the impact of that on the power sector obviously will be tended be overall to reduce demand, but you need to look very closely at how that impacts demand and, and how it will affect the, um, the input into the, uh, into the power sector. In the, in the market review, we actually did the case study of Spain, which has a quite a high level of renewable penetration, both hydro and wind. Um, last year, I mean, as I said, this year, Spain actually had a very wet and windy year, and that was nice. But um, last year, if you went to Madrid, it was beautiful. They had really nice winters, lovely clear days, heavy frost. But that means no rain and no wind. So when that happens, you see something like a 20% increase in gas imports. This year, it was wet, wind blew, minus 20. So obviously that reduced the use of gas in the power sector but as I said it's a very volatile mix and initially our research shows that the, particularly where there's a carbon price of any magnitude then you tend to find gas and renewables together as a whole back out, back out coal. That's, I think that's the trend that we're likely to see. It's um, similar to the trend we're seeing already on the Oh, Bill Hederman from Congressional Research Service. Uh, I would like to know if you talked about the uh, Russian interruption, is, is there any maximum share that you expect to be put in place by the EU in terms of supplies from particular supply areas in the future? And does that affect medium term or is it more long term? I appreciate you. Um, okay, just for the background of others, that there are a number of countries who've taken the type of policy measure that we're talking about. Spain comes quickly to mind. Spain acted in the year 2000 because it was concerned by its overdependence on Algerian gas, which was its, its only supply. Um, since then, it has very successfully diversified its supplies. I'm not aware of any moves by, by Brussels, by the, the EU, to um, impose a similar move. Certainly, they are very keen to encourage increased diversification both of gas sources and gas supply routes and indeed increased diversification particularly in the power sector in the renewables in the low in the, in the low carbon technologies particularly renewables um, to a lesser extent nuclear the position on nuclear is a little more um, a little more nuanced we say um, but no I'm not aware of any particular move in that uh, in that regard certainly um, in Europe people are concerned about gas security there's no doubt about that um, we, uh, we have an, I should say we have an IEA ministerial coming up in October and one of the things we anticipate ministers will discuss is the issue of gas security. Um, we will be putting a paper to ministers and that will have a number of measures in it. Um, 
I can outline those in rough terms if you like, but obviously the final agreement will have to wait on what ministers finally come to a landing on in October. But certainly um, everyone, everyone's interested globally in the issue of energy security, gas security. As Tanaka Khan said, energy security is no longer just about oil, it is about both gas and electricity. Ian, uh, you pointed out the uh, importance of uh, shale gas for the U.S. and North American scene. What evidence are you seeing that this may also occur in other markets, say in Europe or uh, China? Well, that, that's, uh, that's part of the global significance of this, of course. If, if, if it was to successfully uh, translate elsewhere, then, yeah, it would be an absolute game-breaker for the gas industry as a whole. Uh, sadly, uh, there are uh, there are some people starting to do some work on it, um, but it, it's been. I mean, if you you know if you go to geological conferences as, I'll, as I have over the last 30 years, you always get the geologists together and they make all these wonderful comments about permeability and porosity and all this, and everyone has a really nice time and they all go home and do it again next year. Um, we're still kind of at that stage in a number of uh, of um, certainly in Europe. Europe doesn't have the dare I say the vigorous and innovative production industry that you see in the United States. It does, however, have an extremely vigorous and innovative environmental movement, which really doesn't want to see um, drilling rigs, uh, you know, sp scattered all over the place. Europe's a crowded place. Um, there are certainly some potential basins in places like Hungary, the Pannonian Basin. Um, so there's certainly some geological potential, but that's only part of the story. You, you do need the, the, the culture, the innovative culture, the drilling. Um, the fact that, of course, in America you, you own the royalties under your property tends to make people much more interested in having a drilling rig come along. Um, you know, it's only there for a month or two, drills the rig and um, it disappears, but the royalty checks keep on coming month after month. Um, those arrangements, of course, do not apply elsewhere, not, e not even in Canada, let alone in Europe. Um, a s related aspect, of course, is that shale gas is not the only sort of unconventional gas. Co a lot more interested in coal bed methane, especially in China, especially in Australia. In the midst of the worst recession, you know, in 60 years, um, companies were busy in Australia. Um, I say global companies like BG and uh, Petronas are busy paying literally billion dollar amounts for access rights to coal bed methane around in the Bowen Basin in Gladstone. So there's some serious money going into coal bed methane as well as shale gas, um, as well as tight sands. Um, certainly if prices stay at $4, we're, we're not going to see that much activity, but if they move up into the 5 or 6 and you think in the medium term um, most people will act on that, then you definitely see more global activity in unconventional gas. Adam Szymanski from Deutsche Bank. Uh, this question is for David. Uh, David, we had an announcement today that the Rumelia field in Iraq has been awarded out to a couple of big companies. And I was wondering if you could comment on how you see the potential for Iraqi oil development uh, to influence the supply side picture looking out over the next decade. Well, five years since this is the medium term out. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we took a fairly conservative view uh, as regards Iraq, not because of any misgivings about physical, again, physical resource base. I think everyone accepts that the resources are there. But we, we, we were just struggling to see in the short term uh, a regulatory framework that was going to bring this oil, substantial new volumes of oil, on stream quickly, and I think I think that's the key issue. And, and although deals are being signed as we speak, some of the rules are being changed as we speak as well. And there's talk about contracts needing uh, cabinet or parliamentary approval before they will move forward, and so on. Our we took the view that Iraq could potentially, over this five-year period, get to maybe between three and three and a half capacity. Uh, in a, in a sort of optimistic sense, I think our actual number was probably closer to 2.7, 2.8 uh, as our base case forecast. There's no reason why it couldn't be higher than that, physically speaking, but you know, for, for administrative, regulatory, political reasons, probably, fingers crossed, more so than security-related reasons at the moment, um, we think that's a, that remains an impediment. So, you know, 
everyone talks about six million barrels per day, and, and uh, Minister Sharistani at uh, in, in Vienna at the OPEC uh, seminar was, was loudly proclaiming six million barrels per day. And ultimately, uh, if those constraints suddenly lifted, there's no reason why Iraq couldn't produce six million barrels per day. But we don't see it happening in the next five years. That's, that's the reality. Merrick Rasmussen in the Energy Information Administration. Uh, speaking of uh, some country-specific situations, have you, what's your assumption about the outlook for uh, oil production in Nigeria, if they're going to be able to resolve their uh, increased level of violence there, apparently, in the oil fields? I mean, for, for, for the past five years, basically, the, the the situation looking at, at Nigeria has been one of, if you like, divergent provinces. And you've had deep water projects going ahead and uh, augmenting capacity, and you've had the delta uh, in fairly sort of terminal decline because of uh, the, the unrest and the attacks on capacity. Um, I mean, we've, we've got a situation in Nigeria at the moment where there's the best part of a million barrels per day of capacity shut in. Uh, because of those attacks. Some of that basically, in all likelihood, isn't going to come back on stream. Uh, I think for our forecast, we sort of knock out about half a million of that delta capacity. It's an assumption. It's, we, can't, we can't make a, uh, a well-informed forecast about that sort of thing when you're dealing with uh, political and geopolitical risks. But that, that's the sort of assumption we make, that Nigeria is going gonna, is gonna to struggle. Uh, and, you know, we've got net loss of capacity for Nigeria over the forecast period, uh, partly because of that. There are a couple of offsets uh, with new, new uh, deep water projects, such as, uh, I think, Bossi and others, uh, that help stem that rather depressing picture. Um, the, the trouble is we, we for, we've got a forecast with the situation as it is today. And, you know, over the past five years, there's been huge problems maintaining the integrity of the production infrastructure. We have to sort of forecast on the basis that that isn't going to clear up overnight. Uh, and therefore, it's, it's, it's a rather muted picture for capacity overall. Again, not for reasons of physical uh, resource in the ground, but, but because of the, the, the geopolitical problems and the, the security or related problems that, that uh, the country faces. If I can just add on the gas side, of course, we saw uh, the second half of the year um, an unprecedented interruption in, in, LNG, well, in gas production, which meant there was force majeure declared on a couple of LNG projects. It was only a year ago people were talking very seriously about major new LNG investments in Nigeria. Um, combination of the financial crisis and, and the security issues has really dampened uh, a lot of enthusiasm for no additional Nigerian LNG. Plenty of plans, plenty of good PowerPoint presentations, but you know, it's going to be very tough investment environment for new gas in Nigeria. But notwithstanding President, uh, sorry, Prime Minister, the Prime Minister and the President of Russia visiting uh, a number of African countries in the last few weeks. Well, um, I want to thank uh, all three of you um, very much for coming by here and giving this presentation. I think it's a, it's a great opportunity to get the insight uh, fresh off the, the presses. So please join me in uh, thanking them for their participation.